I'll use the board, but uh, we'll use it probably because um, this is going to get a bit thick as we go along. Uh, in the 11th of his theses on Feuerbach, Marx famously announced that, quote, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. That is perhaps straightforward enough. But one way of framing the larger project Alain Badiou has inaugurated over the past several decades, and that's who we're talking about, is to recognize him as effectively suggesting that Marx has here given us a false dichotomy. A false dichotomy that only shows its falsity in light of a complete revitalization and de-epistemologization de of the concept of truth. So return to truth, return to philosophy. If Badiou has almost single-handedly restored faith in the concept of truth, he has done so by calling for an unapologetic return to, of all things, philosophy. Indeed, for Badiou, there's a little difference between what he calls the return of philosophy itself and what he also calls the return of truth. Or again, what is widely been regarded as Badiou's return to Plato. It is generally recognized that Plato was committed to truths in the strongest sense, what he quite famously called the ideas or the forms. That which is clear, however, Badiou adds that Plato's commitment to truths gave philosophy a very particular shape. Plato delineates, according to Badiou, four distinct kinds of truth, namely political, as in the Republic, amorous, as in the Symposium, scientific, as in the Mino, and artistic, as also most famously in the Republic. Philosophy, as Plato inaugurated, there, inaugurated it, therefore took the shape of thinking of the compossibility of these several kinds of truths, of inscribing their complex entanglements. Philosophy for Badiou's Plato is thus a question of taking the several independent kinds of truth as so many conditions for philosophical thought. As I will outline later, Badiou understands truths always to be unfolding, always to be in process. The result is that philosophy, for Badiou, has the task not of thinking about how politics, love, science, and art are all compossible in some eternal sense, but of thinking of the compossibility or the being together of the several truth procedures at some given point in time. Philosophy thus, in Badiou's words, quote, sets out to think its time by putting the state of procedures conditioning it into a common place. Its operations, whatever they may be, always aim to configurate within a unique exercise of thought the epical disposition of the Matthew, poem, political invention, and love. Philosophy is something like the constant inscription of the status of truth as the several independent truth procedures unfold on their own terms. A perfect illustration of the distance philosophy takes from the truth procedures themselves is Plato's Republic. Not only is it clear that Plato there takes as his task the thinking of the compossibility of two distinct truth procedures, namely politics and art, it is crucial also to note that Plato has Socrates explicitly point out that it doesn't matter whether their theoretically constructed republic could actually be instantiated in any actual political regime. The political serves in the republic only as one of several conditions for the philosophical thinking of the nature of the soul. Philosophy has its own projects, apart from the several independent truths to be pursued in their own right. But if philosophy has its own projects, what is its project today, right now, when Badiou is calling for a return to it? He's quite clear on this point. The question that philosophy has to address remains the still unsatisfactorily answered question originally raised by René Descartes. What is the human subject? From at least the 1970s, and in obvious continuity with the work of Jacques Lacan, Badiou has consistently taken as his task the work of sorting out a contemporary model of the subject, of a subject without object, of a subject to truth. Badiou's revitalization of philosophy is therefore as much a return to Descartes as it is a return to Plato, but this double return is without a hint of nostalgia. He is interested in Plato's definition of philosophy and in Descartes' focus on the subject, but he embraces without reserve the obvious advances philosophy has made beyond both Plato and Descartes. And this calls for some detailed explanation. Truth and the subject. After Descartes, truth quickly became trapped within an epistemological tradition, a tradition focused on the theory of knowledge. One that defined knowledge, following an attenuated reading of Plato's Theotetus, as justified true belief. If truths are invariant, unchanging, even eternal, as Plato made clear that they must be for philosophers, it seems that, given the problem of knowledge that Plato had already laid out in both the Mino and the Phaedo, that truths must be self-evident in one regard or another. Invariance implies self-evidence. Thus, during what is usually labeled the modern period of philosophy, two distinct models of truths, self-evidence, emerged. On the continent, European continent, <coughs> self-evidence was rooted in innate ideas, invariants being discoverable simply because they are to be found within one's soul or mind. Across the English Channel, on the other hand, self-evidence was, given the Lockean assertion, 
that the human mind is a tabula rasa, a blank slate. Uh, Self-evidence was rooted in the unproblematically discoverable facts to be read off from the scientifically scrutinized world. These two epistemological traditions, the former labeled rationalist and the latter empiricist, paved the way to the complicated Copernican revolution of Immanuel Kant. In the pathway opened by Kant and doggedly pursued by Hegel, the epistemological model of truth came under consistent critique. Indeed, in many ways, the history of philosophy at this point in the 19th and 20th centuries is primarily the story of an increasingly systematic dismantling of the epistemological model of truth, to which dismantling Marx himself provided one of the most crucial terms, namely ideology. By the time postmodernism came fully into its own by the 1970s and 1980s, and perhaps more particularly in the 1990s, the very claim that a truth could be self-evident came to be recognized as the clearest sign of ideology. Importantly, along with the rejection of self-evidence in favor of truths constructed, <coughs> uh, postmodernism in its most consi consistent formulations has called for a rejection of invariance, of the eternal nature of truths, if you will, outlining a basic philosophical relativism. Tracing another trajectory from the Kantian and Galian break with the epistemological tradition, the phenomenological tradition has attempted a revitalization of the Cartesian project by, eventually, uncoupling self-evidence and invariance. Invariance no longer implies self-evidence. Willing to grant postmodernism its rigor in arguing against the invariance of truths, and thus happy to embrace truth as fluid or mobile, phenomenology has disentangled self-evidence from invariance in order to couple self-evidence with a kind of relativism. In its fidelity to, and remarkably close readings of, Descartes, the clearest examples of which are found in the work of Edmund Husserl and Jean-Luc Marion, uh, phenomenology has thus made it clear that invariance need not imply self-evidence, and that relativism need not imply constructiveness. Uh, just an aside here, the complex position of psychoanalysis in all of this <coughs> deserves at least a passing word. Derrida spent his, uh, much of his career trying to outline the essential equivalence between Heidegger and Freud. And Simon Critchley has built a career out of his arguments that Levinas and Lacan are working on out the same basic project. There is, it seems to me, something very right about Derrida's and Critchley's arguments. There's also something very wrong about them. Uh, but I don't want to pursue that point in any detail here. It's just worth mentioning in passing. Bedil, though, it seems to me, has worked out the importance of the complex history of truth that I've outlined far too briefly here. Banking on phenomenology's uncoupling of invariance and self-evidence, Badu suggests, through a kind of inversion of the phenomenological model, that the invariance of truths need not imply any kind of self-evidence. Truths, in other words, might at once be invariant and constructed. So let me make sure this is really clear. Uh, under the epistemological model, you've got invariance, and it implies self-evidence. Truths are invariant, unchanging, eternal, if you will. Uh, and that implies that they are somehow self-evident, whether that's through a rationalist uh, or, or empiricist model. Uh, this is the epistemological tradition. Postmodernism uh, critiques this, but remains, keeps this implication that invariance implies self-evidence. Uh, though they critique it and hence say truths are actually constructed and, uh, and relative. Phenomenology comes along and uncouples these. Uh, says, no, this no longer holds, right? There, there is a split between invariance and self-evidence. But what they opt for is actually the self-evidence of truths, which they didn't couple with a kind of relativism. What I see Badiou doing uh, is taking over that, uh, that break from phenomenology, but rather than coupling self-evidence uh, with relativism, he couples invariance uh, instead uh, with constructivism. Truths are constructed and yet invariant. Hopefully, we're all on the same page then. Um, but here is working with the effectively postmodern hypothesis that there is no one with a big capital O, that being as such is ultimately inconsistent, that what is is pure multiplicity. This, this Badu calls uncompromised atheism. To say that nothing plugs up being is to say that what is did not originate from some absolute creator, some being beyond being. And for the benefit of those here who may have religious commitments, it remains to be seen whether Badu's atheism cannot be accommodated within particular theological traditions. And that's a question I myself attempt to address in other settings, but just an aside for those uh, committed to religion in one shape or another. Such uncompromised atheism, Badu's atheism, presupposing that being itself is essentially incons inconsistent takes the shape in postmodernism, 
totally lost my place there. Takes the shape in postmodernism of a rejection of invariant truths. Invariant truths in postmodernism are generally regarded as inseparable from religious commitments. One cannot believe in invariants, according to postmodernists, without believing in some invariant God. Badiou, however, suggests otherwise. Invariants can be asserted in a fully inconsistent ontology, in a world without God, if you will. For Badiou, then, uh, invariants mean simply that there are elements that appear in every multiple in a given world. In common parlance, that there are things that, which are always and everywhere the case, transworldly, as he goes on to call it in logic's world. But Badiou recognizes that whatever is always and everywhere the case cannot, by definition, be known. In an all-blue world, one could not, by definition, generate the concept of blue. Everything's blue, right? You'd never come up with that notion. Invariance would be, in a closed world, essentially indiscernible. This is where the basic inconsistency of being becomes important for Badiou. One of being's inconsistencies is its inconsistency in ensuring that invariants remain indiscernible. That is, there are moments in which the very laws of being betray themselves. This is its inconsistency. Allowing indiscernibles to become, though only for a moment, discernible. Such moments are what Badiou calls events. Events are, of course, passing. The indiscernible invariant becomes discernible only for a brief moment. And because the invariant returns thereafter to its constitutive indiscernibility, it is impossible for the person to whom the indiscernible became passingly discernible to prove the truth of the truth thus glimpsed. The subject privy to an event effectively finds herself with the task of giving a name to the event, of faithfully promulgating that name, and so of constructing the truth of the truth over the course of time. Truths in Badiou's system, as it were, look for subjects, as it were. Make sure you catch that phrase, as it were. They subjectivize bodies in order to allow themselves to be inscribed within the world of human knowledge. Badiou's subject is thus the subject of truth, the subject who is subject to truth. Subjects to truth, bodies subjectivated by eventual truths, have the task, frankly, of revolutionizing the world, of pursuing glimpses of invariance and full fidelity in such a way that, point by point, they overturn the order of the world. But such subjects are hardly figures of predestination. Bodies given to what might in a Pauline vein be called the lures of the flesh can desubjectivize themselves, render themselves non-subjects, through a slackening of their fidelity to the eventual truths that have called them to work. Indeed, the positive identification of the good of fidelity allows Badiou to outline a threefold identification of evil, a theory of evil, one that he works out in a short book he originally wrote for high school classes in France. They do a little more in high school in France than they do here. Uh, in his book, Ethics, an essay on the understanding of evil. The three forms of desubjectivization uh, at least deserve names here, though I won't dwell on them. First, one might take a simulacrum for an event, what looks like an event but is not an event. Second, one might betray the cause of the event, uh, give up on it, if you will. And third, one might attempt to name the unnameable, or to take the truth as totalizing. Passing on from that. If all of this, all too sketchily, lays out the basics of Badiou's theory of truths, it is time to turn to one truth procedure in particular, as Badiou outlines it, the one that is obviously of the most importance to this society, the political. So, of political truths. Setting a political truth in motion, given the above model, is obviously the work, so to speak, of a political event. What is revealed in the course of such an event is what Badiou often calls the void of the situation. The idea here, much simplified, and way too short presentation, is that there is something that everyone in a given political situation does not recognize, though it is everywhere at work, indiscernible. An example would be uh, the French Revolution. As the French Revolution got underway, it was not obviously or self-evidently true that a political event was taking place. The French Revolution itself, however, was at work in everything that was taking place, was at work in every multiple of the political situation of late 18th century France. At some point along the way, someone named the event, named it the French Revolution, and thus allowed the name of the event to circulate in the situation itself. This addition to the situation of a name, the French Revolution, was effectively a supplementation of the situation, a supplementation that unavoidably altered the situation, so long as there were faithful militants who ensured that the truth of the political event continued to circulate. Actual revolution thus eventually took place, though betrayal and all of these other evils definitely reared their heads uh, eventually. This is the model and example that Badiou himself outlines in Being an Event, published in 1988. His notion of the event has changed in important ways since then, most notably the sequel to Being an Event, titled Logics of Worlds. 
Here, however, I will focus on the shift marked in his most consistent theoretical treatment of the political, his 1998 book, Metapolitics. Here, drawing on especially the set theoretical mathematics worked through and being an event, Badiv outlines what he calls politics as a truth procedure. Uh, and this is in one of his articles that he describes as one of his most important articles. In Metapolitics, politics is less a question of circulating the name of a political event than it is a question of pursuing the truth of justice a truth glimpsed in the course of a political event. <coughs> Politics thus becomes a question of a truth procedure's universality, and its effect is to present, as such, the infinite character of situations. Those are bad these ones. In other words, the political subject proclaims justice, that is, the universality of her prescriptions, and refuses to betray justice in the name of suffering or death. The proclamation of justice, importantly, allows the political subject to fix the errant excesses of the state allows the state's pretendedly unassignable excess of power over the situation, or the parts of the situation, uh, different constitutive parts or parties of a given society, uh, to be definitively measured, allows that excess to be measured. Thus measured, the state's excess can be subverted point by point through direct political action. The task is not to tackle or to overthrow the state directly, to take it as some identifiable being that has to be uh, somehow subverted but to measure and so to reveal the excess of the state and so reveal the state as the state, to disrupt through a pol political prescription the unmeasure of the state's power. It is in this regard that Badiou's political theory is a subtractive theory. Badiou does not see the task of emancipatory politics to be the overthrow of the state, nor the establishment of a party state that will allow for the withering away of the state. Rather, the task is to secure and hold to the several points that will disrupt the errant excess of state power by allowing that excess to be measured. But it does, by the way, embrace the idea of the withering away of the state, though in a very different model than its uh, usual interpretation. The question, though, is, is whether this is an abandonment or an embrace of revolutionary politics. Here is worth saying a word about Badiou's personal trajectory from 1968 to 2010. He's still alive, in case you weren't aware. Badiou's own insertion into a man, although Greg and I were talking about whether he'll be alive long enough to finish the third book, <laughs> <laughs> being a Benton Law. He's going to be crushed when he sees this on the <laughs> uh, so, Badi's own insertion into emancipatory politics happened in May 1968 when he found himself involved in the student uprising in Paris. He was at the time Louis Althusser's uh, research assistant and taking classes from Lacan and studying Sartre. So, emerging from the aftermath of that event as a committed Maoist, and so as one of the few who did not betray the event of May 68, Badi found himself trying during the later 1970s to formulate a full blown Marxist doctrine of the subject. This resulted in his first systematic formulation, published in 1982, as Theory of the Subject, in which he outlined a preliminary revolutionary ethics, which is to die for. Uh, moving from that initial articulation to the larger project of outlining a Marxist ontology, he came in 1988 to publish Being an Event, a book that is quickly being recognized, uh, even in non-revolutionary circles, as one of the most important books published in philosophy in the past century. There, he revised his theory of the subject, in a number of important regards, contextualizing its political theory within the larger project of philosophy. Politics was now one of several truth procedures, and philosophy had a definitively distinct task. It's so clear when you read the theory of the subject next to being an event. Theory of the subject is political from start to finish, every word, whereas being an event sounds so non-political, uh, though politics does come up often, uh, but not anything like it does in theory of the subject. The 1990s were then given, for Badiou, to working out the implications of his project for the philosophical thought of the several truth procedures. After which, well, so he writes essays on love and on art and so on, uh, all through the 90s. Uh, after which, at about the turn of the millennium, he returned with full force to the question of politics. In a literal barrage of publications that has not stopped, Badiou has issued polemical, historical, and theoretical works, all oriented by the need to sustain, right now, what he calls the communist hypothesis. The most, and if you participate, I guess there are only two of you in the book, uh, reading, the reading thing this last Sunday, but uh, this is the whole second half of Zizek's first tragedy then his poems, dealing with Badzi's communist hypothesis. The most extended discussion of the communist hypothesis is for the moment to be found in Badzi's 2008 book, The Meaning of Sarkozy, though a full-length book entitled The Communist Hypothesis is due out this coming July. So get on Amazon and pre-order. Um, Bandieu announces unapologetically that the communist hypothesis is the right hypothesis. That is, the right hypothesis is the one that claims that there are truths, that humans are capable of truths, that we are more than mere mortals or mere victims. The communist hypothesis is the hypothesis of hope, 
A faith that there is something more to humanity that allows it to be capable of doing something other than, quote, immediately resigning itself to the market economy, to parliamentary democracy, and to the inevitable and natural character of the most monstrous inequalities. In short, to take up the communist hypothesis is to take up the belief that something other than what we've reduced ourselves to is possible and worth pursuing. In other words, there's no humanity if the communist hypothesis is wrong. At the same time, however, Badiou argues that the communist hypothesis has passed through, has passed through two, quote, great sequences. The first stretching from the French Revolution to the Paris Commune, and the second stretching from the Russian Revolution to the end of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. We ourselves are thus, according to Badiou, situated at the point of the failure of the second sequence of the communist hypothesis, at the point of the failure of the model of the party state. We are, in Badiou's own words, quote, in the context of a new interval phase between sequences of the communist hypothesis, a phase in which the adversary appears to be triumphant. The consequence is that we are currently in a political situation in which we must recognize that, quote, Marxism, the workers' movement, mass democracy, Leninism, the proletarian party, the socialist state, all these remarkable inventions of the 20th century are no longer of practical use. At the theoretical level, they certainly deserve further study and consideration, but at the level of politics, they have become impracticable. This is a first point of essential awareness. The second sequence is closed, and it is no good trying to continue or restore it." End quote. That's all that deal. What then is our present political task, according to Badiou, if we are to continue in fidelity to the political truth of justice? He explains, quote, our problem is the specific modality in which the thought prescribed by the hypothesis presents itself in the figures of action. In other words, a new relationship between the subjective and the objective, which is neither a multi-form movement inspired by the intelligence of the multitude, nor a renewed and democratized party. To support the communist hypothesis today in local experiments with politics, experiments that enable us to maintain against the established domination of reaction, what I call a point, in other words, a specific duration, a particular consistency, that is the minimum condition for the maintenance of the hypothesis to appear also as the transformation of its self-evidence. Our task, it seems, is to secure a series of points, and that by ensuring that the truth of justice is not regarded as being somehow self-evident, justice must be shown today to be a question of faith. To the point, then, <coughs> what points are these that Badiou says must be secured? He names a handful of them in the meeting of Sarkozy, and I wonder what more he'll have to say in this upcoming book. The most surprising of which points, however, might be cited in order to make clear, and quite clear, what Badiou has in mind. For example, quote, Art as creation, whatever its epoch and nationality, is superior to culture as consumption, no matter how contemporary. Quote, Science, which is inherently free, is absolutely superior to technology, even and especially when the technology is profitable. Quote, Love must be reinvented, but also quite simply defended. Quote, any process that is intended to serve as a fragment of a politics of emancipation must be held superior to any managerial necessity. Taking these four points together, four of eight he mentions in that book, one notices the task today is to assert that there are truths, whether these are artistic, scientific, amorous, or political. In other words, to assert that capitalism fails because it obliterates the possibility of truths. The points to be secured today are the points of truth, the points that serve as the conditions of nothing less than philosophy as such. The communist hypothesis, in the end, is the hypothesis that there are truths, that philosophy is possible. One must ask whether Badiou's politics have not come then, in the end, to be indistinguishable from his philosophy, whether politics has simply become metapolitics. To some extent, I think one can make this claim. At the same time, however, and there are those who have, incidentally, at the same time, however, it must be recognized that this indistinguishability is in part a consequence of the fact, or at least what Badiou regards as the fact, that we are currently in an interval phase between two sequences of the communist hypothesis. At this point, our task is to think, to secure the idea that there are truths, the idea that these truths can be pursued, as well as the idea that philosophy has a task in the present. To set the title of the book that Badiou and Zizek recently put together, uh, Philosophy in the Present. In short, if the point is to change the world, it must be recognized, according to Badiou, that right now, change will only take place as we prescriptively, creatively, and faithfully describe the world. That is, as we take up the task of pursuing truths. The work of justice for the moment is the work of philosophy.
talked about the errancy of the state becoming fixed and measured. Yeah. Um, so uh, I would I would question about the very process of this fixing and uh, measuring of the errancy. Um, but then also, isn't there a subjective force? It, it, isn't there a, a material force in the world that also um, leads to this subjectivization? Um, in this case, I'm uh, reminded of the work of uh, Chairman Mao, in which he said, without the People's Liberation uh, Army, uh, the people have nothing. Now, of course, the obvious uh, interpretation is that if at any given point the government can come kill you, or the capitalists or the imperialists can come kill you, then you really haven't secured much. Yeah. But it seems that this would fit with the errancy of the state such that in a theoretical, in the actual subjectivity or objectivity of the state, that the very introduction of a counter force, right, so that the state no longer has a, a monopoly on violence, but rather is itself a, a, a political actor engaged in measured political struggles, measured political violence, rather than a, a, a totalized superego that simply permeates the totality of the political space, um, then isn't this one of, for example, simultaneously how one begins to give measure to the errancy of the state, but then also how one begins to counteract that errancy? Yeah, I think that one of the same moves for Bantu, which is why Bantu is very stringent on this, especially in his book on St. Paul, that there is no distinction between action and thought. Which is not to say thought is action, but to say action is thought and thought is action, right? Uh, so that, uh, so, so for him, I think he would entirely agree, as I read. Other questions or discussion? Yeah. Um, so you talked about the failure of the party state. Yes. Um, but it is also worth noting, right? Uh, but he makes this point in numerous places, numerous times, that Marxism is not a theory of value, a theory of labor value combined with a theory of political economy, combined with a theory of ideology, right. but that um, uh, Marxism is a historical struggle. Yes. The name of Marxism isn't the reduction of surplus value, it is the Paris Commune. Right. It is not imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism, it is the Bolshevik Revolution. Right. So in this case, should we then qualify or understand Badu's criticism of the party state not simply as, uh, when he says it's impractical, wouldn't that be an assertion of our con contingent materiality um, rather than a rejection of the form as such? I can't wait for his book in July. <laughs> because I'm hoping he's going to address that much more directly than he does in well, what, he's, what he's written so far. But I, I, think, he seems, I think he seems pretty clear that he's saying uh, the, the task now, he, he sees these, 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 uh, these major sequences, these great sequences. And, and his point is to say that between them, we have, uh, between the first sequence and the second sequence, we have the, the most rabid age of imperialism we've ever seen, right? And now that we're in the second, we have this, uh, this rabid age of parliamentary democracy and uh, the reign of postmodernism and so forth. So I think he sees this as being parallel to that, and the, the task here is, is in some sense to recoup, reorganize the left, and, and then see what emerges. I, I don't know that he wants to say the party state is an impossibility from here on out, but I think he wants to say the task of, uh, of revitalizing that immediately and trying to do that uh, simply through force would be, would be a wrong direction at this point. But it doesn't, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand Badiou, is that there's, there, because of the infinite nature of truth, the truths of, for example, the Paris Commune and the Bolshevik Revolution are perhaps darkened by our historical situation, but not abolished. And I mean, historically speaking, right, it's worth noting that the Bolshevik Revolution, which inaugurated the new phase yeah. of communist revolution, that is to say the party state, yeah. the, the, the communist state began as the previous Period, right? The Paris yeah. Commune, what, what began that period as simple organization, right. um, led to uh, an insurrectionary city. Yeah. And then, of course, in the ultimate crushing of that, we herald in a dark age. Right. You know? right. But it's also worth noting that it's an insurrectionary city, most notably you know, Petrograd, yeah. that brings in the age of right. the party state. Right. So in that case, given that... This, that is, why, this is why Lenin dances in the snow when yeah. they've had as long a time as the Paris Commune. So, but I mean, in this case, right, 
if Mao closes the last period to the disbanding of the Cultural Revolution, then shouldn't we also take it as, isn't it reasonable or defensible, even within Badu, to then take the revolutionary city and take the party state as viable revolutionary, or at least insurrectionary forms, but then to realize the third form will be the Maoist hypothesis, which is a second revolution against the state itself. Yeah. Uh, Reich Van Dunen, see if he'll stick to this, uh, his answer to, the question, to this question. I, I'd love to see how he himself would answer it. Um, because I, I don't know that there are enough resources in what he's written. Um, and so far, I think I've read everything he's got in English. Um, but I, I don't think there are enough resources to give a definitive answer on this name. Uh, but it's, it seems to me that, yeah, he's got to be open to that possibility. He's got to be open to it. Um, but I, I think to some extent we could say it's nothing more than a gesture of humility on his part, simply to say, right now it's a, it's a period of experimentation and thought uh, and, and action in that sense, uh, while we wait and see what emerges. But this, is, and this may be loosely connected, maybe even more, more, more profoundly connected with Zizek's constantly criti constant criticism of Bandu, which is that he doesn't have an economic theory. Uh, Zizek's consistent criticism is, you, you've got a political theory, you're stuck in, in, uh, in state and revolution, you need to read what is to be done, right? Um, and, and he's got some more, uh, even more pointed critiques of the uh, logic of the world. But, uh, but this may be connected to the same sort of thing that Zizek is pointing out, that, uh, this is, it sounds like you're trying to get away from the actual practical issues that need to some extent. That may or may not be. Chris. Yeah, my question, um, so this notion of having a sequence start up, I was wondering if Padu mentioned anywhere uh, the Nepali Maoists or the India, the Naxalites. Uh, has he written on this at all? Because I know she did kind of sound slightly. Uh, I'm not aware of any. Okay, I was just wondering uh, if he'd be very good to chat, like a chime in. But if he does. Like, well, he thinks this is the opening of a new sequence. If he does anywhere, it would have to be in the end of his book, Polemics, but I don't recall him talking about it. Okay. That's his most historical work. Again, this book in July will probably be really revealing. His book, The Meaning of Sarkozy, uh, was meant to be an intervention just after Sarkozy's election in France. And uh, I think Badiou stumbled on this idea of the communist hypothesis, patted himself on the back, and said, I think I've found the video, I've been trying to do it for the last 10 years. <laughs> um, and so I think, uh, and it, it's telling that his next book is called The Communist Hypothesis. It's clearly he's going to try to work through this in, in more rigor and detail. Whereas the other one was a, a polemical intervention. It's not a, a work of theory by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm hoping that he'll deal with more history in this kind of book. Um, this is why I say pre-order on Amazon. So, so, do you think, so do you think, though, I mean, he might be this, right? I mean, Greg, I have a conversation all the time that. If the Naxalites are successful in India, that changes the whole entire spectrum of the world. Yeah. And this could be an interesting one. It's, it's, it's my really much understanding of it, it could well be. And I, I think if it turns out, if it goes in that direction, I think Badiou will be the first to say, here we are. Um, I, what I, I see Badiou being uh, strategic as well in, in his approach to all of this, in that I, I think that part of what he's doing is saying, look, we needed Hegel before, before what happened in 1848. Uh, and we needed. Um, well, as well as we've said about the French Revolution. Um, and, uh, and we needed uh, the theory of, of, of Lenin before the actual Bolshevik Revolution and so forth. So I think there's some extent to which he's saying, uh, I'm going to do the philosophical work and lay this groundwork. The fact that Badiou's work is receiving such wide attention in non-revolutionary circles, I think has done more for uh, the wider viability, public viability, uh, of revolutionary emancipatory politics. Uh, than almost anything else has in the past few decades. So, um, in some, to some extent, I think he's being extremely strategic with this. Okay. Yeah, so I was just thinking, perhaps he's leaving it up to us to actually construct what the future will be, to actually figure it out. Like, he doesn't have an idea, he just figures that it will come out of what happens in the future. I think, I think that's right to some extent, although I think by us he means him as included, right? Oh, yeah. uh, he's, he's leaving that future. The, there's a line in, in the meaning of Sarkozy where he says, I don't know. I don't know, and I'm not going to pretend to know what's going to come. Um, but I think he's got a few ideas. Um, he's, probably just being, he, he's probably just being a bit modest. Uh, he, he wrote a few interventions just after the economic crisis in uh, the French newspaper Le Mans. Uh, 
uh, where he was a bit more vocal on what he thought might be happening. Um, but I've not seen those find their way into any books yet. Chris? I would just ask this maybe as a, I'll just ask it. Um, you mentioned that right, capitalism destroys all truths. Could you give examples of this? Um, I mean, those four points that he mentions are perfect examples, right? So, uh, science is replaced with technology. Science is reduced to technology. Uh, in other words, it's uh, enslaved to capital. So that science can only go so far as the funding, right? Um, or uh, art, uh, the same problem. Art gets caught up in, in economy uh, and all of this kind of thing. So that for, for him, and, and it means that uh, things are no longer free to pursue the truth almost entirely because the definition of those truth procedures gets reduced to a technology equivalent. Right. So things like Valentine's Day for love, and then uh, obviously our politicians are bought off. So. Yeah, I mean, w one example he cites, I don't remember what he talks about, I swear it's in polemics. I was trying to find it the other day. But one example he gives, for example, is, is the struggle uh, to, to legalize homosexual marriage, right? Uh, it's entirely an economic effect. And he says, if, if there's love going on in a homosexual relationship, why not does it need to be registered with the state, reduced to an economic level? and all this sort of thing, it actually compromises the truth procedure of love. The task is to reinvent love and to stand by and say love happens, love is, um, rather than reducing that to its economic equivalent. So a perfect example. Yeah. Um, so just building off of this, would you then say that for Badiou, the method, or perhaps it would even be ontology by which capitalism um, disintegrates truths, is by regulating the situation, by making the situation uh, equivalent, or to make the situation um, regular rather than having a, 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 an inconsistency. To making it consistent yeah. rather than inconsistent. Rendering it consistent, absolutely. Yeah, totalizing. Which is why Badu, this is one of the reasons that Badu's atheism is so important to understanding his work. Uh, because for him, it's, it's a religious move. That, that capitalism is a religious move. It's a way of plugging up with some kind of transcendence, uh, something that plugs up the system so that it can remain consistent. Um, you know, like I said earlier, right, that may or may not fit into certain religious systems or whatever. Uh, but for him, that's a, it's a fundamentally theistic move. And I think that's a, I think it's a, a really striking point. Jake? Yeah, it is manifesto for philosophy. He speaks of sutures. Um, would you say that, that, that this is just kind of a consequence of being everything being sutured to the political? This is. What do you mean by this? Uh, well, I mean like this sort of totalizing of truth via capitalism. It is a consequence of the suturing of philosophy to politics? Right. I mean, because like when you think about it, like all the philosophical issues are things like through identity politics and things like this. And, you know, women's liberation is done through political means and economic means. I mean, obviously, capitalism, politics, economics. I, th I think he's more approving of sutures. I didn't talk about sutures in the paper here. Um, I think he's more approving of sutures than he is of, of economy. I, I don't think that sutures for him are a question of economy. Um, in that sut a suture, uh, for, for everyone else, um, Badu talks about these four truth procedures, and philosophy is the thinking of their compossibility. When philosophy gets uh, attached to one of those truth procedures only, he calls that a suture. So that, for example, in Heideggerian philosophy uh, over the past century, uh, philosophy ends up being sutured to art. Philosophy is the task of thinking about art, just being is a question of art and all of this kind of thing. Um, but I think he doesn't see that as a, as a consequence of economy at all. Uh, what's going on there is simply uh, a missing of what's happening in philosophy. So it's a dereliction, if you will, of philosophy, but not of truths. It doesn't dismiss truths as such. In fact, it may take art to be uh, the, the only truth procedure, but it still regards it as a truth procedure. Whereas economy would actually reduce it from truths to, to this flattened. I see. So it's really just the weakness of philosophy overall. Yeah. Sutures are a question of philosophy's weakness. Whereas what's going on in these others is a weakness of ours, or giving into capitalism, giving into a concept. I see. Yeah. Alright, so I've been wondering this. Most people, they deal in the world of uh, opinions. That's what they care about. Yes. Um, and how would that relate? You know, it seems like only a few people deal in the world, the world of truths. They come up with these ideas, and then they become propagated as opinions. I, in, in my Yeah. And that the people, the masses, don't actually understand the truths that were being taught at first. Um, yeah, 
the whole question is very is, is massively complicated by what Badiou is doing with truths. Right? If I'm hearing you right, it sounds like you're still assuming something like an epistemological model here. Sure. Where uh, so, so for example, in Plato's famous allegory of the cave and, uh, and its divided line from the Republic, you've got the difference between mere opinion or belief, and on the other hand, you've got knowledge, where you're dealing with truths, the forms, and this kind of thing. So knowledge, epistemology, is tied directly to truths. But, uh, but for Badiou, he's trying to break that uh, epistemological model by saying that uh, an invariant truth uh, is actually something that has to be constructed. There's no self-evidence whatsoever involved here. So that um, it's, this opinion becomes a really murky concept here. In other words, uh, you can't say that's mere opinion because the truth is self-evident. Right? Self-evidence is dropped out of the equation. So the difference between an opinion and the truth is much more minimal in Badiou's model than it was under the, the epistemological model, where you could just say, that's mere opinion, whereas this is a question of knowledge. Here, it's not opinion versus truth. It's truths. Uh, truths are, are a question of consistent fidelity to what has been glimpsed in an event, whereas, uh, whereas the opposite of truths would simply be betrayal, uh, abandoning a truth procedure, giving up. So, so I think it's complex to use the word opinion here. It, 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 I don't know that it entirely fits. Okay. So uh, two questions come to mind, perhaps two models of uh, a truth, right? Um, I myself, Marx, Islamist, Maoist, and so I assert, right, the truth of Marx, the truth of London, the truth of Mao. And in doing so, right, I try to express fidelity simultaneously to their text and to their history. Right. Um, but it seems that there's a, a sort of name, so this would, if, if I'm correct, right, because truths are constructible, so there's no way to know a priori whether this is the correct name. Right. The truth. Right. Okay. Um, but it seems that we can determine, for example, that there is no truth in those who call for a return to, say, the Constitution. And the reason why is because there's no fidelity expressed to the Constitution, the Constitution itself being a slave holding document. Uh, it doesn't have universal male suffrage, doesn't have universal female suffrage. Um, and as a matter of fact, in its historical practice, did very little to mitigate the actual oppression of Indians, blacks, women, poor men, etc. So in this case, would it be the case that they have actually betrayed the Constitution because as a text, it's not taken as, as faithful as a return to white landowning male as the core of, uh, of, of this? So, I mean, what I'm saying is, it's not, is there a way of distinguishing them? Would that, be a, 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 would that be correct that we can point out that this is not, in fact, a fidelity to the Constitution because it entails a violence to the very truth, if you will, of the Constitution itself. I think Badiou would be fine with that. Uh, the, the one tiny uh, point I would make to make sure that, that we're on the same page is just that for him, it's that still, that critique, still has to be made in the name of faith. Right? So that, uh, that there's, again, there's still no self-evident God is going to come in and fix either side and say, ha-ha, you win, right? Um, as in the international, right? So, uh, no, no, we say savior from beyond or whatever. Right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so as long as both sides, uh, the one side in full faith has to say, yeah, I can't prove this to you, but I am going to stand subjectively here and say, there are truths, and you're obliterating truths. And I think you can, I think you can argue uh, quite straightforwardly in such a case that, uh, that those adhering to the Constitution in that sense would, would be denying truths. They might call it truth and say, but is this your model of truth? Is this your model of truth? So, so I, I think that the, the argument can be made rigorously. It's not a kind of pure fideism. Badu has been accused of that. But I think that's a, I think that's a bad reading. Um, but it does, it, one does have to recognize that self-evidence is never going to. And I think that's so crucial in making sense of what he is calling for when he says the task now is to, to assert that there are, there are truths, there is thought. Uh, because everyone loves justice. <laughs> everyone loves justice. But his point is to say, but they're taking justice as self-evident. Uh, and what justice is, how it's going to unfold, they're taking that as self-evident, that's what has to be ruptured. And that's the excess that has to be measured. Just quick follow-up then. Then is it, is it then fair to anyone 
um, who claims to have a truth, to demand that they demonstrate some sort of truth procedure out of which they they derive their truth of the event, yeah. as it were? Yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, in fact, I definitely think so. One thing that took me a while to gra grab hold of in Badiou is the, the position of knowledge. For him, genuine knowledge is produced in, in the pursuit of truth. Uh, though you don't know the truth, you do produce genuine knowledge in the pursuit of the truth. So scientific knowledge is knowledge. It's not something we can just dismiss because scientific truths are always all. This, this is not decked out, right? Um, but uh, so genuine knowledge is produced, and you can, I think, I think you could require, show me some genuine knowledge, show me where this is actually paid off. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, in Commonwealth, uh, Hard Negri's newest book, they level some uh, critiques against Bob Dylan's Yeah, I need to read them. I was wondering if. Just to find out what that is. <laughs> right, and he, I think one of the things they talk about is they dismiss Bob Dylan, but the Bob Dylan event has, like, looking backwards, was sort of the Victorian event, is more forward looking. Yeah, that's what they said. So essentially, yeah, yeah right. But I was wondering is, do you know if Badiou uh, first has responded, or what do you think Badiou would say to somebody like Negri, who essentially would assert a sort of a spinacistic worldview of uh, we're all embedded in the modes of capitalism, so we've got to do our best, sort of thing? Yeah, the, so, so on the one hand, I'm not, uh, to answer the first question, right? I don't know if I'm responding to it. Uh, he mentions Negri once in passing in Logics of Worlds. Um, but I'd have to dig out the reference again to see what he said exactly. It's in, it's in the introduction where he says, it's in a letter from Antonio Negri to someone else, and Antonio Negri says, we postmoderns know the truth that there are only bodies and language. And bodies and language, okay, so it's on that point. So um, I, if he has responded, it's in French, and I have to find it. <laughs> um, but as, as for the second question, yeah, I think Bandi would just say, this, this looking to the future, and unfortunately, I think Agamemnon is read this way as well as being very like negative in the same regard. But I, I don't read it that way. I think Zizek misreads Agamemnon at this point. Um, but uh, but yeah, this idea of looking to some events still to come, Foucauldian, um, Derridian, and so on, um, it, it it renders the present absolutely powerless. Um, it, it may, it, and I think that's exactly the problem with negative and how it's modeled. We're waiting for that. Yeah, we're waiting for the return of the gods. It ends up being kind of gay. And uh, whereas Badu, you can say it's looking backward if you want, but it's inventive, it's uh, it's at work, and it's doing something productive. Uh, so I, I think Negri's, if if that's really Negri's and Hart's uh, critique, I think it's pretty bad. But okay. so, so I was reading about Foucault and how he says that truth has to be for all. Yeah. You can't say that it's just for some. Absolutely universal. Yeah. And and what I'm getting and what I'm wondering about is if truth is for all, but yet not everybody sees the truth, mm -hmm. right? Or accepts it, um, it seems like that's the biggest problem with um, um, promoting the truth. Um, like in the communist revolutions and things like that, eventually it became terror at some point, where they were forcing people. Um, if they weren't willing to live. They say, well, you have to. Yeah. Um, how do you stop that? You know, how do you actually just have the truth go out there and be universal, but yet still create a society? So, first point of clarification for Badu, terror is not a bad thing. Badu's fine with terror. <laughs> <laughs> the reign of terror is a good thing for Badu, uh, however you may feel about it. Um, it's, it's naming the unnameable that goes too far, right? Uh, a forcing of truth because because truth is weak. Tr truth is fundamentally weak, and this is essentially what you're pointing out in your question. Yeah. Right? Is that truth is weak. It has its own force, but no one's obliged to believe it by any means. Right? Yeah. Um, and so th to name the unnameable is to get to the point where because the truth is weak, one has to somehow prop up the truth. And that, that's where it goes too far, perhaps. Um, how is that avoided? I think Bedu says, the truth is weak. How can how can you how can you talk about avoiding that? You just have to uh, encourage yourself. This is one of the reasons that Badiou's ethics is a complete inversion of the traditional method of uh, understanding of ethics, where there there are some self-evident ethical rules that we can agree on. Those are absolute points. Whereas in Badiou's ethics, there, there's no there's no self-evident ethical rule. Uh, they're just guidelines, and uh, we're always going to run the risk of going too far. So I was just thinking that the only way that that could actually exist is that people themselves have decided to do that. And amongst the people that have decided to live by that truth, they could actually 
Yeah. But the risk remains it. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you to talk a little bit more about constructiveness and, and its relationship to uh, invariance. Yeah. Because when we're talking about discovery of a truth, asking for somebody for a truth procedure, the way that that kind of comes out and grabs me is the sort of historical analysis. Okay, what comes from this? What truths seem ev uh, what truths seem to uh, well I'll just say it, what truths seem evident after a particular event a naming you know yeah can you talk more about that yeah so let me let me make this uh, the, the options very clear here right so if you've got uh, if you will modernism right and you've got invariance and self evidence mm -hmm. right and, and that eventually leads to postmodernism um, where you've now got uh, the idea that truths are relative and constructed, and that these imply each other. Uh, constructed meaning merely constructed, mm -hmm. and relative, relative to a given situation, to bodies and language, mm -hmm. in terms of Cartesian introduction, bodies and world. Um, so th this is, I mean, this is the history of the Cartesian project, right? Uh, phenomenology takes up a position outside of this uh, by saying we could take we could take a piece from each of this, if you will, right? In some sense, uh, truths are relative, relative to a given situation. Um, and yet they're self-evident. And the shape that takes in phenomenology is um, interpersonal, intersubjective relations. What's self-evident is the otherness of the other person. Uh, and it, hence, truth is relative to that person. It's mobile, it's fluid, it's changing uh, in relation to that. And I see back to you then taking up this fourth position, uh, the only option left in some sense, right? Which is uh, to say that they are indeed invariant, but constructed. So that whereas, uh, Whereas in postmodernism, constructiveness, the constructiveness of truth, this is to say Foucault, right? The constructiveness of truths is to say that they are constructed uh, through an unfolding history and this kind of thing, so that they end up garnering power in certain ways and this sort of thing, right? Play a power. Um, whereas for Redding to say that they're constructed is to say that there's a process of, through which an actual and varied truth is pursued and, uh, and genuine knowledge is produced. So the, the work of construction here is rather than some sort of unconscious uh, process through which the truths, in the Foucault sense, are constructed over time, socially constructed, and so forth. Here, they are constructed through a process of fidelity. Genuine knowledge is produced as that process of construction unfolds. Uh, and what they are all building on uh, and going toward and working out is an actual invariant truth. So what sort of repositories of truths have come? Repositories of truths? Well, I mean, if there's a truth that is discovered, and it's an invariable truth that is revealed by some sort of event, okay. you know, trying to get too much into it, but basically you're, you know, you're able to pull that one single truth, or maybe a dualistic truth that doesn't really meld into one another. But wouldn't those persist after time? Like after you have several events that happen, right, and you have different truths that come from different events. You know, after a while, we would accumulate those truths, right? So accumulate knowledge, at least, right? Well, because the truths always remain, the truths themselves can't be known. So we produce knowledge in the process of pursuing these truths, but we don't produce some repository of truths. We produce a repository of knowledge, which he calls the encyclopedia of knowledge, right? Um, and so we constantly revise that encyclopedia of knowledge in our pursuit of truths, uh, but we never have some sort of repository of truths. I don't know where we're at first. Ah, yeah. So you take these last two questions and then we'll move on. Uh, just uh, you're welcome to stick around. Matt's going to do a history lecture on the Irish Republican Army, but you're obviously under no obligation to. Um, isn't isn't it the case that there's not a repository of truth, but there is a bearer of truth? Right. Which would be uh, the subject. Right, and and that that subject in politics at hitherto has gone by the name of the party. Right. In art, it goes by the name of the work. In science, it goes by the name of the body, not physical body, but the, the body, body of knowledge. Scientific truths. And then um, for love, it goes by the name of the couple. Yeah, the two. So. The, the two for him, not the couple. Oh, sorry. That's actually crucial for Benedict. Oh, sorry. The couple is always seen from a third position. The two is the two as such. But, uh, right. It, well, I'll talk about it later. Oh, just that. It just seems like uh, in terms of a philosopher in Norse, is that what you sort of talking about last time with art? How art is through time, you can see how it's sort of changed. Um, you learn anything. Yeah, but Ronsay and Badu disagree strongly on art, uh, on, on the status of art. Very strongly. 
Uh, and I think Rantier raises uh, what are some of the most important criticisms of Badiou I've found. Um, I don't know where I settled on the argument. So. All right, I'd love to give Joe a hand for.